All right, thank you all for coming. Sorry we're going to start a little late. It's a very exciting day for us in gold. Uh, but uh, today we're not talking about our excitement in, in gold games. Uh, we're going to talk about the core of gold, self-sovereign digital identity. Uh, so if we first have to ask, what is digital identity? Uh, it's a pretty complex subject. Uh, but we can think of it as sufficiently unique and trustworthy data about an individual for the reader of the data to be certain of their identity. And yes, that's, that's kind of subjective. Uh, it's a gray area. Uh, and so this is why you'll see many different standards of digital identity, uh, different data that people are asking you for, for proof of who you are, for instance. Uh, so some common examples that we have today. Uh, we have a, a corporate authentication scheme. Uh, so, does corporation recognize your identity? Uh, usually this is social media or a telecom. Uh, you see login with Facebook, login with Twitter, uh, that sort of thing. And all they're saying is, we're going to outsource your identity to Twitter, Facebook, whoever they say you are, we're going to accept that, right? Uh, that's for usually low value sites and, and data. Uh, but for high-value things, uh, we are often asked to do financial authentication or identification. Uh, and this is a typical Know Your Customer KYC data set. Uh, you have to have a government ID, uh, some sort of proof of residency, like utility bill, uh, and proof of uh, funding or a bank reference. Uh, so one government data point, two corporate data points. You'll notice a common theme of all of this, that the owners of your identity are not you, the individual. It's corporations and governments. Uh, so corporations, uh, social media companies, own basically all of your pictures and videos and uh, audio and blog posts and things like that. Uh, for your credit, it's usually owned by the corporations, like in Panama. Uh, each individual corporation, Cable Onda, owns your Cable Onda credit record. Bank owns your credit record with them. In the United States and other countries, you have credit agencies that own it. Still, you don't. Uh, for these know your customer data points, again, it's utilities or companies that are billing you, uh, or KYC services like LexisNexis and Trulio uh, that have private databases or uh, query public databases. Uh, banks. You know, they're asked for their own records, right? Uh, even medical records, uh, hospitals and, and private databases uh, keep and own all your medical records. If you want to prove that you got vaccinated for something or uh, some, something about your medical history, you have to go and ask them to send the records to someone else uh, because uh, you don't get to own it. You don't get to, to be the keeper of your own medical records. On the government side, uh, they obviously uh, issue all the state IDs like passports, uh, but in most countries they also own them. Uh, so if you look on your passport, it will say, you know, do not destroy property of U.S. government, so on, so on. They can take it back. They can do whatever they want with it. You do not have the right to do that. Uh, same thing for various certificates, certificates of birth, death, marriage, uh, various events that you might go through in your life. Uh, they're the ones that control the, those records. They can issue duplicates whenever they want, for instance. Uh, and uh, you're not able to, to certify these things without their consent. Uh, licenses for how and where you can work. Uh, operational things like vehicles and fishing or whatever. Uh, and then they have their own official databases like watch lists and uh, sanctions lists and various other lists of of millions of, of people. So what does this leave us, uh, the individual? Uh, basically our bodies, the only thing that they, they let us own. And biometric data is not very good because uh, there's an uh, excellent article lately that said, uh, your fingerprint is a username, not a password. Uh, and this is the truth, because if I use this to authenticate with Apple, for instance, Apple now has my fingerprint. They could print it out with a nice 3D printer and fool most fingerprint scanners, right? Uh, you're duplicating your secret. You're sending the secret out to everyone. Uh, or you they just cut off your finger. So biometrics is not really a great uh, 
source of data for a number of reasons. So you're basically left with nothing. Uh, your digital identity is owned and controlled by anyone but you. Uh, your bank, uh, your government can impersonate you anytime they want. Anyone that hacks your bank or your government can impersonate you anytime they want. You are not actually able to identify yourself, however, without their assistance. Uh, so this is clearly a problem, particularly in, in the peer-to-peer -peer realm. Uh, we need sovereignty of our own identities for peer-to-peer -peer contracts. Uh, and the way that you take sovereignty of your identity is to become the primary source of the digital data uh, about you. Instead of publishing your data first onto Facebook or uh, first onto uh, some other corporate or government database, you make sure that you publish it first in your own name in an independent channel signed by you. You claim the copyright over every single thing that you do and you timestamp it and share it with all your friends and say, witness this, this is my thought of the second, right? Uh, this is like a heartbeat. Uh, if you do this all the time, if you, if you do it consistently, every blog post, every tweet, every photo that you create, you publish it at least to your friends, at least a hash. Uh, they can all see all of your digital activity ticking by throughout the day. Uh, and it's not unrealistic to think that at least once a minute, one of us creates some digital record somewhere. You check your, your cell phone, you've got a new email, you're sending a tweet, you took a new picture, uh, something like that. Uh, so this, this stream of data, if you can control it and if you take ownership of it, is the ultimate digital identity. Uh, because it's, it's not just a single data point, it is your wave of data in the, the internet, in the data sphere. So how would we organize this data? Introducing your block tree branch. Uh, the block tree is uh, the, all of the data in the world that's structured this way. Uh, we each get our own identity branch. Uh, so when you register with gold, you're claiming a name. And in that name space, uh, you fill out your identity, all the records of your identity. Uh, so you would start when you register with gold, when you register a name, you have to provide a key. Uh, and this is your signing key, your official signing key for your identity. Uh, and this is how you register your name in the first place, is saying, I am such and such, and I will sign with this key. Uh, those keys are PGP keys, pretty good privacy, uh, but you can store other keys in your, your keys uh, sub-branch. All these are sub-branches of your uh, person branch. Uh, you also have a ledger sub-branch uh, directory for all of your financial activity. Uh, you can account for all of your, your banks and cash transactions as well as crypto. Uh, you can register devices. Uh, so for instance, this device is registered. Uh, I forget its name. OL1, I think. Uh, but uh, you can register your devices. Uh, you can even register bots or AIs. Guy is a bot registered under me for instance. Uh, you can keep all of your documents, uh, and each of these also branches again. So you can create subdirectories for personal documents, various business groups, your medical records, right? Each with their own permissions and, and access. And finally, all your pictures, other media, videos, audio, and so on. Same sort of deal. Personal stuff, shared stuff. You, you choose the permissions. Uh, so you may notice this looks a lot like uh, your home directory on your computer, uh, and that's actually how we structured this. Uh, this would be, you know, if you log into your computer, this is, this is Linux. If you have a Mac, it pretty much looks the same. Uh, you know, your user has a pictures directory that are your pictures. Your user has a documents directory that are your documents, right? The difference here is that all of the pictures in your pictures directory are hashed, and those hashes are shared with all your friends to, so that when you take a new picture, a new hash shows up, and I send it to Louis, and Louis can at least say that the state of Iris pictures changed. There's a new picture that's there. You may not be able to see the content, but if I shared it to you, you'd say, yeah, that's the one. That's the picture that showed up in your directory five minutes ago, right? So uh, if you're running our file system, 
all this happens automatically. Picture saved, it's automatically shared, goes into your heartbeat, right? Uh, this is all managed by your keys. Uh, and usually when we talk about digital identity, a lot of the focus is on, on keys. Uh, so our system is uh, built around PGP. Uh, and that's the only required key uh, for using gold. Uh, you use PGP for signing various things. You sign the block tree itself, so you, you sign your, your perspective or sign witnesses uh, to your, your friends. Uh, you can sign contracts and transactions. Uh, but PGP also allows you to encrypt and decrypt things, which lets you have permission data. So you can say, this data should only be accessible by these 10 people or those 10 people, right? Uh, additionally, in keys, we would support Bitcoin and Ethereum keys, uh, which let you sign. They don't encrypt contracts and transactions. We don't let them sign the block tree. Uh, but many people use, I, I saw an hour ago, a friend of mine had his ERC20 Ethereum address uh, in one of his social media profiles, saying that, you know, verifying this is uh, who I am on the Ethereum network, uh, and actually many of the uh, ICOs and, and services that launch also have to do the same thing. They have to prove which address on the Ethereum network belongs to their group or the, them as an individual. Uh, so Ethereum is really used a lot like this today, uh, and th they are signing contracts a lot of the time. Uh, and we would just recognize, we would let, you know, the, my friend who published it in his Twitter profile, he would sign it with his PGP key, uh, which is an even greater um, gives us an even greater degree of confidence that it is his Ethereum ERC-20 address, right? Uh, and then he can go about signing his contracts and transactions. Uh, so that's all of the, the key management aspects and, and uh, how your key, keys would look on your computer. Um, one of the most complex activities we do online is, is social media. Uh, so typically, you know, you would take your, your pictures and some of your documents like blog posts and shower thoughts, your audio and your video, and you would, uh, you would paste them directly into uh, Facebook or Twitter or some other social media platform, right? And when you do that, they actually uh, claim copyright and all your stuff and, and usually all, all sorts of other uh, interesting things. Uh, but what we would suggest is that you first sort all of your media, your various media that you, that is social in nature into one of these three categories. Is it purely personal? Uh, in which case you just encrypt it only for yourself and synchronize it to your various devices. Uh, is it shared with some other group of people? In which case you should encrypt it for that, that group only before then publishing it. Or is it meant to be public data? And if it's meant to be public data, you should still go through a very careful process where you first sign it and then self-publish, right? So to release things, uh, you always want to publish first to your channel. Uh, I put your website here, uh, but really uh, it could be any, any kind of website that you have permission to publish your own copywritten material. That's good, the AC. <laughs> um, so for instance, GitHub will, will let you host all this material for free. It's ugly, uh, but there's no reason why you can't put all of your pictures uh, signed into GitHub and then tell people, just go follow the link, right? Uh, from here, you would then syndicate the material out to other networks, right? Uh, so for instance, if you only link to your website from Facebook, from Twitter, from wherever, uh, you reserve, uh, first of all, the 100% uh, of the legal rights to your work, uh, but also uh, you control the, the distribution of it uh, because you're the primary distributor of all of your pictures and videos and so on. Uh, so that's how we would recommend managing your media presence. Uh, also very important for digital identity are official documents. Uh, so we might look at medical documents, government documents, or, or corporate documents like bills. Uh, and in, in each case, we have a primary document, uh, which would be signed by an official. Uh, so for instance, your medical records would be signed by your doctor. 
uh, say, yes, I really did this uh, vaccination, let's say. Uh, and you would put your doctor's signature into your medical documents on, on the original file, right? Uh, and that would be then encrypted just for you and your doctor, or just for you, your doctor, and your insurer, let's say, right? Uh, you might do the same thing with a government document, uh, you know, a license or something. Uh, you know, the agency that issues it would sign the document uh, and encrypt it for themselves and for you, uh, and you would save that in your own government documents directory, right? Uh, same thing for a bill, let's say, right? Uh, the point is, is that you're preserving the original signer. Uh, it is, you are not claiming that you got vaccinated for measles. Your doctor is saying that you got vaccinated for measles on specific day, right? And so when I go to uh, someone else and, and try to prove my vaccination record, a university or something, uh, that I can provide them with an original source, right? Uh, now, how would this process look? Uh, so for this medical record, a vaccination record, let's say, right? Uh, again, you would store it for person X. Uh, so person X has their own documents, documents of X. Inside that, they have person X's medical records, right? And X's doctor would sign the record and put it into X's medical file, right? X would then update the reference to it in his documents, recognizing, yes, uh, I had a new event in my medical timeline, right? So all of X's friends, including his doctor, uh, witness all of these state changes to, uh, first of all, person X as a whole, event happened for person X, right? Event happened in the documents sub-branch, right? So X's documents changed. Uh, the medical sub-branch of documents, so X's medical documents changed, right? And here's the hash of the new record, right? Now, X's friends can't actually read this record, uh, not necessarily, but again, they see hash medical event happened, right? Uh, and they are witnesses to medical event. And if someone were to show them the original vaccination record, they could run the hash and say, yes, that's the record that showed up on such and such day. Right? Same thing with a doctor. So the doctor is co-signing your whole medical history. Uh, so this allows us to do what we call a proof of record. Right? Uh, so uh, let's say that uh, this, is a, this stranger is an immigration officer. Right? Uh, and the immigration officer wants to know uh, if person X has been vaccinated for measles because there's a measles epidemic running around their country, something like that, someone else's country, person X's country. So person X says, okay, here's my medical record. Uh, how does he go about handing it off, right? Uh, he takes the original uh, hash or signed record that the doctor gave him, re-encrypts it for the immigration officer, right? Uh, and the immigration officer then runs a series of checks. First he checks the hash of the document, right? Uh, which should match this, right? Uh, he checks the doctor's signature against doctor branch, which is not shown here. Uh, and then he checks the doctor's branch to make sure, here's doctor's branch, that it has this same series of hashes leading up to hash of this record, right? So immigration officer has now seen your doctor corroborating not just that he signed that record, but actually into the overall state of your medical history that you could present a complete medical history and have your doctor sign, yes, that's complete, nothing new has happened, right? Uh, so, presumably, after all these checks, yes, okay, I have an original signature by your doctor, you were vaccinated by measles, welcome to stranger country. Uh, on a more holistic scale, that's just for individual records, uh, but we can make uh, a proof about somebody's identity as a whole. For instance, uh, you could call this a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, death certificate, the ultimate death certificate, right? Uh, so uh, person X uh, is publishing their heartbeat of data uh, as they go about their day. They're checking into restaurants, taking pictures, selfies, whatever. Uh, and all of their friends and their doctor and 
their business associates and so on, are uh, following uh, and witnessing the, all these events in, in the time scale of this person's life. Uh, and let's say we have a generic unit of time, uh, T1, right, or, or T, right? And so at T1, all these people agree that person X had this state. They just left college, vaccinated for measles, went to stranger country, right? Now at T2, uh, again, they've all been following and they can all agree that person X is now left stranger country, didn't like it there, went back home, caught measles. No, uh, <laughs> it's vaccinated, we have proof. Uh, anyway, they know the state at T2, right? At T3, same deal. They can all agree uh, what's going on, or at least, you know, uh, what is the, the overall state, what's the numeric representation of the state of person X, right? Now, let's say that after T3, person X goes quiet. No new selfies, doesn't sign into any account anywhere, no transactions, credit card, Bitcoin addresses, everything's silent, right? And this goes on for T4, T5, T6, all the way up to T13. There's been 10 time units now with no activity from person X, right? Let's say that you're a life insurer, right? Uh, and you have a life insurance plan on person X, and you're trying to determine uh, whether or not person X is dead, whether or not to pay out the policy, right? You can do this in a very simple uh, and very powerful smart contract. Uh, you start by following or checking person X's friends and doctor, right? Uh, and you ask a simple question. Have any of X's friends seen activity from X in the last 10 time units, right? Uh, if every single person says no, or if they say yes, they can't prove it, right? You trigger the clause. Uh, you say, okay, uh, this is the, the, the term. Person X agreed to it, that if he has no activity, if all his friends agree he's had no activity, they haven't seen from him, hadn't heard from him for 10 time units, fine, I'm dead. Consider me dead, right? Uh, so they pay out his life insurance policy. If a single person has a record provably signed by X, you know, at T9, uh, you know, he woke up and made a big transaction for something, uh, just, you know, with one friend, and that was it. And he just went back to sleep for another five time units, right? That one person, just by providing that one record and saying, look, person X woke up at T9 uh, and there was at least one event, right? That resets the clock. Uh, and so that one person would now say yes, and the life insurer goes and waits for another time unit before rechecking, right? Now five more time units go by, still no activity. Okay, fine. Now we trigger the clause. Uh, and now this doesn't have to be a life insurer, it could be uh, you know, a lawyer with your will, could be uh, any sort of contract that's dependent on death of person, right? Uh, but the point is, is that this is uh, a very uh, certain thing uh, because it depends on your, your social network and, and uh, the consent, the co-signing of all of your friends and family, your doctor, everyone you deal with. Uh, so on a more abstract scale. This is how we could define end of a life, end of a digital identity. But how do you define the beginning of a digital identity? Uh, one way to do it, if we're talking about a person, if, if this is meant to be a, a complete uh, human digital identity, uh, we could start with the record of their birth. Right? So person B, this baby, uh, had record of birth, co-signed by their family and their doctor. right? which gives us an initial hash at time zero uh, of person B, record, name, beginning of, of life, beginning of identity, right? And then they f this continues up through T1, T2, and so on until triggering death clause, right? So what are the advantages of this kind of social definition uh, or peer-to-peer -peer -peer definitions of life, death, uh, and another kind of uh, personal events? Uh, if we look at, for instance, birth certificates, many people do not have uh, good, uh, I don't know how to say good, uh, birth certificates that others would consider uh, valid, right? Uh, so many rural areas in, in um, less developed countries, 
you know, we'll have a very informal birth certificate, uh, for instance, that may not be stamped correctly or something for the United States. Uh, or you might be in such a rural area uh, that you don't get anything, right? Uh, but what can we do? We can issue one retroactively to you. Uh, and, and this, basically all your friends and family, uh, even your doctor would get together and they would say, yes, person B was born on June 4th, 1950. Uh, and you know, your doctor would say, you know, I wasn't there, but looks like a 68 year old, uh, like person B is 68 years old, all his friends and family agree, therefore uh, I'm willing to, to co-sign on this as, as uh, person B's probable uh, birth, right? Uh, now if everyone has consensus about this, uh, that should be good enough uh, for person B's local government or uh, some other institution uh, to accept uh, that that's as good of a record as, as we can get about person B. Uh, I didn't pull this, this method uh, out of the air, by the way. Uh, there's a very famous economist in Peru, uh, Hernando de Soto, I forget his last name, not to be confused with this explorer, but Hernando de Soto. Uh, and uh, he applied the same sort of process to formalize informal land titles in Peru in the 80s. Uh, so in these uh, poor neighborhoods in Peru, uh, they did not, the people did not have proper uh, government titles uh, to their land that they'd, they'd built on. Uh, but what he found uh, when he went in and uh, went to these communities uh, is that they had informal systems on, for instance, a uh, bulletin board for the community. So they would uh, pin up uh, a list or in, uh, paper titles on a bulletin board and everyone knew uh, that that bulletin board was the official land registry of, of the neighborhood. Uh, and social contracts uh, mixed with some, some local strongmen would enforce that nobody messed with the bulletin board, right? <coughs> Uh, but what Hernando de Soto was able to do in Peru was get the local government to recognize uh, these bulletin boards and to formalize many of these titles uh, that had been held by uh, these communities. Uh, he, so he said, or got the government of Peru to say, community issued and tracked titles are valid titles uh, and we will now accept them into to the land registry assuming that there's no conflict with a, a, a prior government land registry title, right? So these sort of retroactive socially defined title systems have been uh, effectively executed by governments in the past. Uh, the other advantage of this sort of socially definable uh, personhood or, or event time stream is that it's non-forgeable. Uh, so uh, person B's family and doctor have their own uh, records and histories uh, that person B cannot forge no matter what uh, because they're co-signed through this mesh backwards in time, right? Person B also had a record of birth co-signed by his family and person B's doctor, I'm sorry, person B's doctor, you know, also had a record of birth co-signed by his family, you know, 90 years ago or, or whatever, right? Uh, and uh, all those people uh, kept the timeline honest all throughout time, or at least uh, cosine retroactive uh, timing for it. Uh, so it's extremely difficult, uh, basically impossible to forge these sorts of records. Uh, and they're continuously updated in a continuous stream until death, uh, which allows you to make statements about the whole, uh, the whole person. So for instance, if we're talking about medical records, you don't query individual records or even a subset like vaccinations, but you say, tell me every event that happened to this person and prove that no new events have happened, right? If his doctor said an event happened but he's not recognizing it, I wanna see that one as well, right? Uh, and you can get a, a holistic proof about a person or a certain aspect of a person's identity. Uh, it's not just technologists that are working on this. Uh, this is a very hot topic with governments. Uh, probably the most progressive government in this space is Estonia. Uh, Estonia has official government IDs for, for residency. Uh, they even allow uh, foreign residents to, to register online and pay 60 euros or 300 euros, I forget, and, and become an Estonian e-resident. 
Uh, and when you do this, uh, you register an RSA key, uh, which is PGP compatible. Uh, so it's basically the same system that, that uh, we're using. Uh, and this RSA key becomes your official Estonia government ID. You can sign contracts with it. You can sign transactions with it. Uh, and you can access various government services with it. Uh, Estonia has talked about a more complex, or, or sorry, a more comprehensive uh, digitalization of their government, of, of putting their government on a blockchain, uh, which is to say that all of these records would now be chained in a, a timeline uh, like we've been describing, uh, but they have not officially committed to that yet. Others, however, like Dubai, have uh, officially committed to that. Uh, Dubai has said that by 2020, their entire government will operate this way. Uh, and they've already got their land registry operating this way. Uh, so, uh, oh, I want to clarify, uh, operating with digital records on a blockchain, not via social consensus land registry, right? Uh, that's not very Dubai. But uh, the point is, is that uh, Proactive governments are, are moving on this today. These are just two examples. Uh, many other larger governments like the United States, Britain, uh, innovators like Switzerland are all uh, innovating and prototyping various systems like this, but mostly because they're bigger, they're taking their time on, on actually rolling out implementation. Uh, but it's definitely happening. Uh, governments are also uh, picking up on this and, and digitizing identity. On that note, I hear in Panama uh, they're considering RFID identities uh, in the cellulas. Uh, and I would really like to have them use RSA, PGP instead. It's a much, it's a much better system. Uh, so if we can now agree on the presenter, the audience, it's now happy hour. Yeah. Let's go drink some beer. Uh, after question. Break them in, George. <laughs>